Hello and welcome to the official Scottish Rugby Podcast. This week it's a best of episode. We look back at some of the lighter moments over the past couple of months. Enjoy. If we could just go back to your, your first cap, Jim, 2006 against Romania. What are your thoughts on, on that game? Well, interestingly, um, I became the thousandth player. Of course you did. What well, well, are we? 15 minutes in, and you've only just mentioned it. I've heard this so many times. So, what number were you? 986. Take your time, we're going to choke on that banana loaf. No, <laughs> it's good banana loaf. Lindsay's made a banana loaf for us all today, and it's terrific. Jim's on his fourth bit already. Mossy, what were you? 600 and. Uh, <laughs> what was that? 940. 940. 940. So yeah. it's only 60 between us. Yeah. Really? And what are up to now? It's about 1,100 1, I'm not entirely sure wow. Two or three, yeah, yeah. So you're, you're, uh, the, you're the thousand Guilty, that was me uh, And it was between me and Dave Callum So he, he was, obviously we naturally spoke about it And again, I spoke about it earlier in the show It wasn't a case I'd, I've been in the system Did I know all the lads like I probably should have Before I made my first cap? No Did they know me? No So there was this added not expectation added animosity gloss I was going to say gloss <laughs> <laughs> I was very, I was annoyed I was annoyed no, that, I was. That, that, that I was going to be the thousand but he was if it was no I'd be delighted for him because we're very good friends back then I was you know, I was yeah. Was, he's not even Scottish. Nice <laughs> I, 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 I don't know about that, Al. You seem to know more about Jim's career than he does. He does. You've got every he's bit of ingrained in your brain. I was, I was there for all his big moments. You've just tucked in behind me. Oh man, he, he was. He was. I was hating me. I was hating me as he's watching. Oh, what's he doing? English, English. I don't, I want, you're not allowed to use the words that he was probably calling me as he was watching the game. Um, but yeah, so Jason White actually got injured that game. He, he, he did his ACL. I remember him getting stretched off, and you know, obviously that was a bad. A bad thing to happen for the team. So Dave Callum went on as nine nine nine, and there's me thinking, if I get on, I'm going to be a thousand. It wasn't a, you know, for me. It was spoken about, but it wasn't a huge thing. You know, when I made my first cap, I made my debut. It wasn't a case of like, was it the best day of my life? It, it didn't feel like that because it had came around so quickly. You know, within two or three weeks of having discussions. Mm -hmm. I, w I was up here being capped and, and that's the way that it was there I mean they clearly weren't happy with the second rows that they had in the, in the squad <laughs> you use that one. Every, every time we do something together you oh, use that one. I know but I think you know they're looking to add strength and I, as I say I was, I, was, I was playing at Leicester at the time and I was playing well and I was in the kind of spotlight so I think they did want to cap me you know, I've got a tendency to change my mind and go back on things but you know looking back now I don't look back and say oh you know making my, you know, my cap was the best day of my life because so many other things happened later on in my career like I made my 50th against Australia and brought my son on I think when you have the kids and stuff like that mm -hmm. your whole perspective on it you know on everything changes and you know that was a big turning point in my career as a player but I, I remember actually we got given well I got given we were sponsored by Famous Grouse at the time got given a, um, a personalised bottle of Famous Grouse and on the label uh, they had it all done instead of saying the Famous Grouse it said the Famous Jim Hamilton and then on the back, it had a, a whole kind of piece about being the thousandth player, mm. which they put in a nice box. And one day, I'm sure I'll crack it open <laughs> when there's something to celebrate, I think. Now, before we look at the, the other fixtures, just while we've got you here, Stuart, just want to talk about you know, where you are now as a player and where you've been. Obviously, it's quite an interesting story for you when you look back at your, your career here at Scottish Rugby and beyond and also what you do off the pitch as well I know you're, you're, you're a keen pilot and that's something that you really enjoy doing out with when you get the time but you touched on it earlier on you were on the bench in 2012 for I think it was Scotland versus South Africa, is that the game? And yep. You didn't get on did you no. in that game but you're on the bench as uh, a back row Yep. and then three years later you actually get your first Scotland cap that whole period of three years what's that like as a player to know that you're, you're moving position and you have to wait three years to get your actual Scotland cap how did you find that whole that whole journey yeah it was uh, looking back it was quite tough at times um, you know it's, it's worked out really well now which is great um, but it was really hard at the time because I sort of I sort of established myself with Edinburgh as a, a back rower that could play at that level and I managed to get on the bench for Scotland, and I was I was 22, 21, 22 at the time. So I was I was really excited about my, where my career could go. And if, I, if I'd done that by the time I was twenty one or twenty two, um, you know, I was confident my best years were still ahead of me as a back row. And um, yeah, it was it was hard. The, when the decision came to maybe move to hooker, it wasn't it wasn't something I took lightly. Um, but at the end of the day, I just I decided just to go for it because 
the support was going to be there for me. I was I would have had the whole backing uh, of Scottish rugby to do it, and um, I didn't want to look back and you know if I, if I hadn't made it as a back row, I always wonder what if I just you know had the guts to go for it. Um, so I, yeah, I just decided to went for it. It was hard because I was going from playing every week at back row for Edinburgh to then playing no rugby for about six months. Um, and playing for Edinburgh means a lot to me, and um, it's my home club, and and that was really hard to do, and just to watch watch Edinburgh do well and and not be part of it was qu- quite hard. But then you know I had the, the sort of long term plan. I was I was working hard behind the scenes on my scrummage, and I think this I had to hit like a hundred scrums before they let me play. Um, so it was all being managed properly, uh, and then um, invited down to Bristol uh, to, for the, it was 2014. I went down there. Um, to to sort of apply my trade a bit down there, and that that was great. I look back at that as a big part of my development because I was down there just as a, a hooker. I wasn't a converted back row, and uh, no one really knew about me as a back rower. It was just I was there as a hooker, and and I was expected to be able to scrum, and I was expected to be able to throw into the line out. So um, it really it really forced me to just to get myself in at the deep end, and I look back at that as a, a big sort of reason why I improved a lot. Whose idea was it? Moved to hooker. Yeah, Scott Johnson. Scott Johnson. Yeah. yeah. To your point, the way your career's grown, you, you, you should mention to you, you're Scotland Day International in the back row. Um, you yep. Over 50 caps for Edinburgh, Scotland Day International on the bench. It was going well, but with hindsight, I mean, the, the move has been brilliant for you, so a tip of the hat to Scott Johnson. Yeah, no, it was uh, it was his idea, and, and he spoke to my agent about it in depth, and just they decided if they thought I I would go for it, and then I, I went outside. Um, my, my agent phoned me; I still remember he phoned me. He's like, I've been speaking to John about you moving to hooker. What do you think? And I was like, absolutely no chance. <laughs> and, uh, and he was like, heard of it, or? that was the first I heard of it. Yeah, and um, yeah, it sort of completely shook me, and I was like, what are you talking about? And then actually explained it to me and, and sort of talked about the long term plan and it wasn't a, it wasn't so much a negative move. A lot of a lot of back rowers move to hooker before they play pro rugby. Um, because they, they're maybe not big or quick enough to do it as to make it as a back rower. i I'd, I'd you know played fifty times for Edinburgh and that excited me because, you know, if I move now what could I achieve? Um, so that was a big part of, of trying to do it and, and do it well. What we did this morning on Instagram is we put up a post and we asked our fans to get in touch with any questions they wanted to ask you and we got a couple of them in, just going to ask them for you just now. So one came in from Rory Britton, he wants to know what has been your favourite moment in a Scotland jersey? I think there's probably two, uh, one of them uh, was beating England last year and lifting the cup at a cup, that's something that um, was really special to, and to do at home was really special. The other one for me is is the New Zealand game um, last, last autumn where... Um, it was the, the big uh, event for Doddy as well, and Doddy presented the match ball. And I remember being really, really nervous for that game. Um, you know, playing the number one ranked team in the world, and, and not really sure how I was going to get on or how we were going to get on. Um, but then when Doddy came on with his, his family, it just sort of put a lot of things in perspective, and it really actually helped calm me down and um, realise, yeah, it's, it's a game of rugby, and, and I can we're going to be fine. But there's some things that are bigger than rugby, and, and I loved, I loved the that whole occasion. And I still remember when. Um, you know, we lost that game by I don't know how many points, but the ball went out at the end. We just lost at Murrayfield, and, and the whole stadium was chanting Scotland. Um, and it was it was a moment I'll never forget. The final question is: It came in from your teammate Ryan Wilson. <laughs> believe it or not. Now I don't know if this. Can I guess what the question is? Yeah, yeah, you guess the question. Is he asking if, if you're allowed to throw anything out of airplane? <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Have you ever thrown a tangerine out of the window of your plane?" <laughs> He's asked me that numerous times, and the answer's always been the same. And it's uh, no, you know, it's one thing you're not allowed to do is throw any object from a plane. That's why I'm not allowed to mount any of my GoPros outside the aircraft as well, because if that falls off and it's class as you throwing something from the plane. And, I probably lose my license, but yeah, no. He's uh, he's fr- frequently asking me that question. He also sent that question about four times and changed tangerine to Satsuma. And <laughs> <laughs> so. John, just go back to two thousand five. I believe you were captain the under nineteens in Durban. Is that is that correct for your? Sounds yeah, sounds yeah. familiar. What's your memories <laughs> of, of of that game? And, and <laughs> I don't know if I was. <laughs> I was dropped halfway through as captain, so I can't remember. Um, you under 19 captain Durban. Ouch. What was in yeah. Durban? Was Jamie. that the World, was World, World, Cup, was a World Cup. Cup? Yeah, yeah, very insensitive, Jamie. Pictures, man, of the match, John. <laughs> um, when we're when looking back, you can remember that. Huh? Sterling under schools you're playing for Dollar at the time yeah Dollar versus Murkison and we had to pick the man of the match and I chose you so I generally take credit for most <laughs> things you've done in the back of that. so you founded him did you yeah, yeah. Ram- 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 Rambo selectors. showed me a photo of me giving him his under 18s makes, uh, makes you feel captain. old eh? yeah it does yeah. he's only two years younger than me because we're, we're a similar age you know no, no. absolutely not <laughs> 
to be fair, once you got that man of the match for the school, you were with the national squad about six, well, three <laughs> months later, wasn't it? <laughs> and bigger than everybody That's else right. already. Yeah, how, one how, was that? how was that? Is it first involved? I remember it was, uh, it was Matt Williams as a coach, yeah, wasn't he? Yeah. 17 years old. And he came in straight from school. Yeah. That'd be easy. I, mean, I went out the night before and I got a phone call. <laughs> so I didn't know. I'd just been out. I was. When you say out, you were at school, so just. I was out uh, getting some restaurant. Shopping, or, yeah, some okay. Shopping. <laughs> and uh, I got a phone call from. It may have been Graham Law, but I didn't know Graham Law at this point, or someone from the union saying, John, you're in the. In the Scotland squad. And I thought, wow, brilliant. That's, and it was the night, it was the 21s. <laughs> I thought it was the 21s. Of, I didn't even think. And then they phoned again and said, oh, you, you need to come through to Murrayfield today. Uh, you and Gordon Bullock are doing... Mm. And I, at the, still, I'm thinking, why are the 21s Dude, so <laughs> launching their autumn campaign with, with the... Camp? And then I went through and it was a... Yeah, it was a bit of a nightmare. It, it was it was amazing, but, like, I, yeah, I rocked up and put my bag down and then I'd put it in Simon Taylor's space. So he removed <laughs> it. I came back, my bag was in the corridor. I was like, oh, thanks, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> 17. Yeah, it was... Uh, and then I shared a room with... But yeah, I was going to like hotels and we were at Dalma Hoy, weren't we? And right. I shared, I think I shared with, I don't know, I mean, JP, maybe, or JP. <laughs> and uh, that, it was weird. These were like my guys I'd watched, yeah, literally a couple of months before on TV and like never, you know, I thought I'm just going to sort of start out playing professional rugby and then, yeah, three months later. <laughs> yeah, maybe not the best thing looking back. One thing I want to ask you too about Mossy and Mike is colour blindness. It's something you guys suffer from, but as professional athletes, what kind of effects that maybe we don't know about does that have on you guys when you're when you're performing at elite level? You got Marcy, I'll agree with you. Yeah. Um it's funny, you like, see if you're coaching you lay a red cone out, you can't see it and the it's red I'm red green colour, but you're the same, yeah, right? same So way. do you need somebody else to tell you that's I a have red to cone ask you're whoever coaches like a green or yellow cones as well. Can you confuse me? So I'm not sure which one's which but you can't you can't sh- if you put it on the grass you can't see that cone. Well, if, if you, you have to look really hard to see it, but you can't see it in your periphery. And, and if you say, right, run to the red cone, you're like, somebody's moving my red cones. But if you imagine you put a green cone in the green grass, that's yeah. for me, that's kind of like what a red cone in the green grass is. Like you, you kind of see it if you're really focusing it, but. Yeah, you have, yeah, it, it kind of blends in. But remember, I was injured, but you played at a game at Pitodre where mm. there was snow on the field and the, <laughs> the lines got painted well, red to go pink. You can, yeah, that's it. Because I, I think. I, I was maybe captain at the time and, and the game was almost in danger of being called off but they said oh we've managed to sweep most of the pitch but we've had to uh, paint the touch lines just so that you know if a bit of snow does come down we'll be able to differentiate between the white lines and the snow I said oh, alright cool I said oh what colour are you putting them? I said I've put them red I said well that's not very helping I said well, why not I said well I can't see the red so it's just like a massive pitch for me and a massive open pitch and then we turned up mm-hmm. and I was speaking to the groundsman uh, just before I went out and he's like, are you the one that's caused this issue? And I was like, oh, sorry. He's like, it's the first game you're going to have pink touch lines <laughs> for. So that was brilliant. Wow. But like, I, I, I think like, like there is a, a kind of serious element to it. Like when I watch um, like Wales, South Africa or something, mm-hmm. I see basically 30 strips the same. Mm-hmm. Like when, when I played, like if you had, if you had made a line break or something and you're trying to find your support, like some people pick up that really clear, um, you know, color c- compared to differentiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or if someone's in the, if you've got a winger who's standing up against the crowd in behind, you might not be able to really clearly pick out that. That I, winger. I remember playing, if at night time. I know it sounds weird, but when we played for Edinburgh and, and kind of dark red shirt and, and Scarlet would come up with a dark red. Mm-hmm. I remember a couple of times making a you know, a, a line break from counter attack running <laughs> what I thought was space <laughs> and somebody <laughs> between two of my own men and just getting it's absolutely smashed. <laughs> and it's like, just because you, you, your focus is almost on the ball, you're running, you're scanning the whole time and because there's not that real clear division in our, in our eyes, I suppose, I remember just getting absolutely smashed and thinking. <laughs> uh, so did you no have like to. any like strategies or anything that you, or things you could work on that makes anything easier or... Oh, this mm. is fascinating to me. I had, I had no idea. Mm. I've had, um, this for I've, I've complained about strips before. Yeah. Um, to our, you know, saying why we're not like if we've got an option to, to wear a white against a dark blue, mm-hmm. you know, why we're not playing in white as opposed to playing in uh, black and dark blue. Mm-hmm. Like I'd, I'd have issue with those colours as well. Mm. There's so many um, outfits that Mike's worn on a night out that are beginning to make sense to me as well. <laughs> it wasn't his fault. It wasn't his Can fault. See. What have, what have I ever seen you in a night? I'm trying to avoid <laughs> me. I've seen you, I've seen you sneaking off on many nights out, Michael. 
But that, that for me, camouflaging myself. It's a bigger problem when you're doing colouring in with the kids. <laughs> if they ask the kids, what colour is that? Why? <laughs> Brown. <laughs> Yeah. But like it, it, it goes, it goes in why's, purple why's, trees never like Why is Robin Hood red? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but like it goes into like so, for example, like analysis stuff that we'll do after a game, we'd have a a graph with maybe three oh, different yeah. colours in it that are showing like ball carries, tackles, and clearouts or something. And and it was it was red, green, and yellow or something. And I'm like, you've got three, you've got three things, but you've only got two colours. And I'm looking there, shaking my head, how. I'm professional. It's like Mike. There are three colours there. And you know you just the, other, the other one, uh, and you're the same because we've spoken about this. It's a nightmare. You know the red laser pointer you get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if there's stuff in the screen <laughs> and, and coaches or players are using the laser pointer to suck up, I just can't see the dot. I can't see the red dot, and I've no idea where the space. We're going to attack this space here. Or <laughs> the minor, the and like, need a meter stick. To I'm no idea where that's The amount of times that I've been <laughs> using it and pointing at the screen, <laughs> like go for three or four seconds. Say, oh, sorry guys, the, the like, pen's not working, <laughs> is it? And the light is all over the screen. <laughs> Can't pick it up. There was a period, John, where you you know you had a time away from Scotland. Was that a real difficult time in in, in your in your career? And, and and how happy were you to get back? I thought you were going to say how happy was I to not be picked. You made it sound like a choice. You had to <laughs> some time away from Scotland. <laughs> um, yeah, it was. Um, I think if I'd been playing in Scotland, I would have found it much harder. But I was in Wales, away from the bubble um, and really enjoying my rugby so I think after about a year or so I kind of resigned myself to the fact I couldn't I didn't think I could play much better at that point in my career and I was like well maybe this just isn't 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 going to happen for me you know horses for courses and sometimes it didn't fit but um, yeah thankfully you know Al asked me earlier about if I found dealing with poor performances easier or harder since I've got older but I think non-selection I found a bit easier like I just gone with it you know I, I kind of had to take a more philosophical view to it and I've got kids and that's definitely kind of like kids and family and that sort of stuff made that non-selection m- much easier we only had one at the time but it was it was tough but you know I always had that desire I always had the desire to play but I just almost resigned myself that it wasn't going to happen for a while. Do you think it made you a, be- a better player overall because you, you, you gave all your time to Scarlet you gave more time to the game itself not having to think about other 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 distractions? Maybe I, th- I think the year that I wasn't uh, sorry the year before I got picked again if that makes sense was probably the best I'd ever played in my career. Um, I don't know what year that'd be, but yeah, I, I literally I couldn't have played better, and that's, I still wasn't getting picked. Um, so that's kind of when I thought, oh, this is this is maybe it. But I think being involved in a with different players, uh, you know, a different mindset, different coaches, different culture was was really positive for me, and I was lucky to be part of a squad that very much transitioned and grew year on year from when I first went we kind of finished sixth and by the time I left we were we'd won the league we were finalists of the, the, the league the following year and we were in the ch- semi-final of the Champions Cup so I was I think there's a lot of luck involved in when you when you move clubs and I think I was sort of right place right time Mossy you played a bit of one season away from, from Scotland as well you know for you as well what, what was that like and, and as a player do you how does it affect you when performing for Scotland? <laughs> You just get on with it. Like, it's a terrible answer, but whatever whatever challenge is placed in front of you, you just get on with it. Um, the difficulty for me when I went to Gloucester was it was immediately after the 2007 World Cup, so I missed was it, well, the pre-season, the early season, I missed about four or five league games, um, and then I kind of fought myself, fought my, my way into the side, and then Six Nations came along, um, and then you're away and back and away and back, and I, I remember a poor game in one of the final weeks away against Bristol um, and it was pretty difficult at that time because you, you never really felt truly part of it so I think what John's saying uh, you know and what you're saying to John actually having the Scarlets and that was it was probably really good um, for you it, it, you know you commit totally to it but um, yeah uh, whatever whatever challenges have had you, you, you go on with I'd say you John as well you're obviously very fond of your time in Wales they were very fond of you but now you've moved back up and we don't often ask this question, but what would you miss about Wales? About Wales. Is there something you miss that you... Um, Careful how you answer <laughs> this, John. <laughs> yeah. Well, just because you've been so fond of it, and, and they really appreciated what you, what you committed to them, and it sounds like a, you know, a really good period in your career. Um, I miss... Uh, it's hard because I've not played for Edinburgh, so it's, yeah. a hard, it's a hard question to answer, but I really miss the, I really miss the, the, the people and not just mm. the players, like the... The community the, spirit. The community was... And I kind of heard that about Wales, but... It's hard to sort of explain when you live. I lived in a small village about half an hour from Clanetley, and I was 
just just you know very much part of the community and it was maybe easier for me because I was a, a Scottish person in Wales so I wasn't sort of hammered by them too much yeah. but yeah, I really loved the the community and we lived in a nice a nice part of, of Wales and um, yeah probably the, the sort of community and the everyone wanted you to do well it was mm. the, the expectation was there and they got frustrated when you when you didn't win but they also kind of backed you very similar to the Scots they just kept backing you no matter what When you come off the the, the bus on a match day I, I can't think back but do you have headphones on do you want to hear the crowd do you want to listen to music what, what's your routine I wear headphones till I get to the gates of Murrayfield and then I take them off you want to and it's something I always say to someone that's getting their first cap because I reckon that's one of the best experiences is you pull into that front gate out there and suddenly you see all the people and you think oh here it is and then you take your headphones off and about three quarters of the way in they the pipes start playing and they pipe you in and you start to hear the pipes and then the fans are going crazy and so I said it to Sammy Johnson recently I said make sure as soon as you get into the stadium take your headphones off and he said to me after he said oh mate how good was that so um, yeah I love it that's, that's one of the best bits and then getting off and you know, all the fans are everywhere up up the stairs and yeah, it's brilliant. So that's my ritual. Get them headphones off. George North now has nineteen championship tries in the Six Nations. Only three players have more. Do you guys know who the other three are? Chris Patterson. No, stop it. Six Nations. No. Uh, Brian O'Driscoll. <laughs> Brian O'Driscoll is top with and how many? Ashton. How many? No. Uh, what was North on nineteen? Dreco with twenty two? Brian Driscoll's got twenty six. Good effort, strike rate. And then, so we need one more, or two so more. two more. Shane um, Williams? Shane Williams, correct. Nice. On how many? Less, between, <laughs> between 19 and 26. And 26. <laughs> uh, 23? 22. Oh, I knew Sunday was in 22. And there's one more. Uh, I don't know if you'll get it. G- give me the country. Scotland. And Six Nations? Well... Define Six Nations. Well, uh, well, six, well six since 2000. And the, uh, and the <laughs> six <laughs> six <nations. laughs> Let me rephrase the question. <laughs> and five or six nations. Five or six nations. Ian Smith. Correct. Thank you. Ian Smith. How many tries did he get? 21. 24. Mm. And he only played 32 times for Scotland between 1924 and 1933. Scotland's record try scorer alongside Tony Stanger. Correct. Hamish, you've got some experience playing Scotland Sevens. Looking back at your time, when you, you first came here, you were essentially contracted to Sevens, is that right? You, you played in a few tournaments? It was um, it was a dual contract back then, I think. So I played a bit, I think I played like four games for Edinburgh that year and then did four um, did four um, circuits as well. So I went to New Zealand, uh, to do Wellington, Tokyo, Hong Kong and Vegas. So I got a few good trips in, and um, <laughs> I not, wasn't not, not bad. Rubbish, yeah. I wasn't the best sevens player back then. I mean, we were all pretty young, and it, it was very different to what it is now. I think if you'd go and play in that now, it's an amazing. Obviously, it's an amazing opportunity either way. But the team now, they're getting to the quarterfinals, um, and they're getting they're getting better and better year on year. You know, it's a pro it's a pro setup. You got pro players out as well. Back then, we only had maybe two pro players. Uh, it was made up of academy boys like myself, and then a lot of club players. Um, and we only trained maybe twice a week. The club boys came in on a Wednesday night, so it was. It's not like it is now. Um, and I mean, I remember losing to I think the Fair Islands and once. So or cook, was it? No, it was a Cook Islands or something. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, it was. Um, we yeah, we. I mean, we we had a few good victories, but there weren't there weren't many in us. And if you actually look at our squad, we had a few great players there as well. But um, yeah, it was something I'd love to try again. It's just trying to to do all. I don't know if I'd be good enough either what, <laughs> after all that what players were you were you, you mentioned the squad but what other players were around you then during your time in the sevens uh, so it was uh, Scott Andrew, Riddell, Andrew Turnbull <laughs> Scott Riddell was still there but Scott Riddell was still there Andrew Turnbull uh, Budgie um, go on, go on, go on. Colin Gregor how many tournaments did he play oh, he did loads mm, he did a lot yeah uh, so they were Colin Gregor and Andrew Turnbull and Scott Riddell they must have been they I think pros. three pro guys we only had three yeah, pros yeah. Then it was like uh, me, Sean Kennedy, Sam Adala Klein, Adam Ash, Rory Hughes. So a load of young boys. Sorry if I left someone out, but like it was a lot of young academy players with pretty much near to no experience. That like maybe a few of us had a few pro games under our belt. Um, and then you had um, the club players who came in. Um, so yeah, it was um, it was tough. What? Um, when you look back on that, I mean, you talked about the tournaments you went to, and you were in 
where did you say you said Tokyo, you were in New Zealand, you were yeah. in Tokyo. Fair you're traveling the world. Yeah. Nineteen <laughs> years old. <laughs> see, when, see when you get the call to say, by the way, you're, you we need you for for Edinburgh this week. We're mm. we're, we're playing Dragons away. Yeah. Um, uh, you're not going to go to Las Vegas. Uh, where was your head at there? I mean, it sounds as if the the sevens was a dream for you boys when you're, I suppose, younger. Um, yeah, I think so, I think so. It was amazing to do the tournaments, and I was really happy that I went on four amazing tournaments and went to see some amazing places and play some great rugby. But I think my end goal was always to play for Edinburgh. I think I played one game quite early on, so I got like a taste of playing in the 15s, and I think I always knew I wanted to play 15s. So when and it was different like the academy now you don't train with the we don't train with the main squads whereas back then i was we That's were right. training every day with um with mossy and all those boys um mike blair chunk like all those all those old lads like so old you, lads i think uh, <laughs> i think that ah, that's what we knew we wanted to do um was alster was alster away yeah that's Alistair, right, i remember yeah. you come off the bench yeah, yeah. so um yeah so i think that's i think i knew i sort of wanted to do the 15s and that's what we, were, we actually trained at um, and then you actually went away to the sevens for a couple of weeks, so it wasn't actually full time with the sevens. So it's more fifteens of your main stuff, I think. But the sevens made you a better player, made you a better fifteen. Oh, player. definitely. Like skills wise, I think I could do a few things pretty well. But apart from that, like my probably my core skills weren't too great. I mean, I could always like, jackal and you know carry hard and stuff. But actually, sevens just develops those those things in your game that you really need, like the passing and. Just one on one, one on one tackle. I remember they played New Zealand, and it was I think it was Tomasi Tharma. I flew out of the line, and he just stepped me and ran the length of the field. And I think that was one of the most embarrassing moments <laughs> of my career. Um, and it's just little stuff like that. Your your tackling needs to be so good, um, and your um, your detail and stuff. So I think it does make all these players so much better. You score any tries? One against Uruguay. <laughs> Nice. Was it a good try? It was horrific. <laughs> <laughs> it was, How just, was it horrific? I think they had maybe like two guys in the bin and it was just an overlap <laughs> and I just trotted it in from a meter out. I would like to think if I did it now I'd be a bit better. Grant, we've had a few questions in from some of the fans. Um, first one being, how much has Richard Cockrell helped you? Uh, and it goes on to say you've never been on better form. Oh, that's very kind of them. Um, I think Cockers has made a a big impact on, on my career I think the biggest thing for me with them coming in was it was a fresh start for me so it was a chance to you know I'd had a, a couple of bad years with, with injury and then I'd had a year you know that was a frustrating year for a number of reasons mainly because we, we weren't playing well um, I, I particularly myself wasn't playing well um, I was captain of the side and, and my approach to it was like anybody would be you know, try harder, mm -hmm. do more, try harder, do more, do more in the game, do more in training, mm -hmm. do more, do more, and and uh, my performances were just getting worse. If anything, uh, you know, I was, uh, I, would, I couldn't, I couldn't step back and just see what 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 was important. And then uh, I think um, it was probably just slightly before Cockers came in that I, that I think I eventually got to the point where Hodge had to drop me for the team, which was deserved and. Uh, yeah, I had no problem with that. I knew that I wasn't performing, and it was that kind of detached myself, go away and just what what is it that, that I need to get better at? What do I actually need to concentrate on? And you know that focusing in the mind and just a good almost ground zero. Well, you know I'm going to start again almost. And um, the difference then was I started played a few better games towards the end of the season, took a bit of confidence from that, and Cockers came in and laid the law down you know um i, I can't remember what my one to one went but it was well i do remember <laughs> it was pretty straight down the middle and and i think i don't know if he maybe expected that that's exactly how i like i'm i don't mind that um like alwa boy i'm not going to be offended um very easily and i definitely wasn't and i agreed with everything he said and i said well i'm you know i'm here to graft and i'll work hard and i think he was a bit dubious um, but I just put my head down, worked hard, worked hard at my game, and um, he, true to his word, said, you know, if you work hard and and you know play well, then then I'll pick you, and if you don't, then I won't. And that was kind of how it how it started. I just went from there, and and he showed faith in me to to pick me at the start, and and then hopefully I've I've managed to kick on. So t sorry to take you back, because I think that's really interesting. That you step back. You you needed a change in mindset. You were you were struggling. You were just putting more and more pressure onto yourself. How did, how did that come about? What was the step back? Was it being dropped, or was it 
getting away on holiday and actually getting away from the club for a week or so and, and realising actually what I need to do here is just simplify things, just go back to basics. I think it, I think it probably was getting dropped. It was it was over New Year. And I think there's I played in the Glasgow game um, and didn't play very well and, and got dropped for the next week. And I think just that feeling of, right, well, I'm actually just going to train for myself a bit more. So it was a bit. It felt a bit selfish because I'd been captain and I was trying to do everything for the team, mm-hmm. and all from the right point of view. But the best thing that I could do for the team was be the best me, um, and I wasn't being that because I was getting tied up in loads of other stuff. So just getting my head down and and just simplifying what what actually what actually I'm supposed to do in a pitch that's effective, and just work on that and probably focusing more on my on my strengths rather than my weaknesses as well. Like what what it was that I was good at. Like, you know what should I be doing in a game and. And, and concentrate on that and that, and it quickly I felt like I was training better and I was training with a real purpose rather than just training to try and get the team ready for the next week you know I was training for the purpose of getting myself better and then when I did come back in my goal as well was to I, I don't really care about the result I obviously care about the result but I want to make sure that everything I do for Edinburgh Rugby was as good as it could possibly be and then from then on it felt, I found the mindset that works for me. And does, it, does the enjoyment come back in a bit quicker then? Because I can yeah. imagine when you're putting the pressure on yourself, the enjoyment yeah. factor's not there. Is yeah, it? exactly. We were losing a lot of games and it was just, you know, darker, darker. You have Monday, you talked about it at the start. Mm. Monday being easier to come in after a bonus point win. Well, it's certainly tough when you lost eight in a row. And that's where we were at. We'd lost that, that many games and I was shoulder and loads of that. So it, it, then just stepping back and then playing and, and th- I think, oh, actually played very well and we won the game and, and all of a sudden it was like oh, I actually enjoy playing, I enjoy training, um, which quickly drained out of it and that enjoyment I think for me, I, I love what I do and when I love what I do, I, I play better as well Such an important message isn't it? Like, I, I could almost resonate with every single thing you said there. Yeah absolutely Definitely, I don't, you Al as well, but like, there's definitely elements of what you said there that was exactly how I thought through whether it's good times or bad times and especially as a captain you do you you, for, you forget about your own game because you're you're working so hard to make sure everybody else is okay and the reason you're a captain in the first place is because you're good at what you do yeah. and you, you move away from it so that's a brilliant message and it's good to know that when you do actually take a step back the recovery is quite quick like you said yeah, there yeah, as soon was, as you it was within weeks yeah, it, it yeah, felt like clear oh, your head you get minute. on with it yeah it's good you're a wise old man Gilco for only being 20 know, hey. uh, yeah getting closer to speaks more sense than you Al. <laughs> Not the fearless leader. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, moving on, moving on. The teammate with the best banter. And we're going to get Mossy grumpy because banter's not a word that he likes. But uh, the teammate with the best banter. Um, I enjoy the the banter of the young boys at Edinburgh. There's a there's a few that they're as weird as as you could possibly imagine. <laughs> oh, brilliant! Who? Um, Tell us who. I know who you guys. Well, number one's Magnus Bradbury. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Or Blair King. Oh, um, or um, yeah, just any of that lot. Lewis Carmichael. What about Young Darcy? Is, um, is, young, is he the opposite? Is he like the serious uh, young he, guy? Yeah, he's he's not he's not. Like, those boys are wild. <laughs> like, I thought I thought I'd seen it all well, but. <laughs> Honestly, they they open my eyes on a daily basis, um, but they're a lot of fun to be. Around. Like they they bring a hell of a lot of energy to to training and life in general, and they're as mad as they come. So was it not Hamish who had him? Uh, was it week two or three? And he said something like he'd been walking behind. I think it was in a Scotland session with Adam Hastings and Blair Kinghorn, and he had no idea what they were talking about. They yeah. didn't even think they were talking the same language. Yeah. No idea. No, I I, mean, I, inter- I interviewed them over the course of. Six Nations, you were there, Kilco, and I, 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 at times I was just letting them go because I had no idea what they were saying. You yeah. just made up words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even a proper language, but. Uh, You're rubbish at countdown then. <laughs> well, it depends which dictionary yeah. they were using. Well, if I made that Urban though, dictionary, yeah. If I made that, they'll know, yeah. you'll know that past. <laughs> <laughs> Who in the Edinburgh team has the worst pre game music? Um, I don't know who I'm going to throw under the bus here. I'm, I'm rattling through the whole team. Jamie Ritchie took it upon himself to just start putting his music on in the changing rooms, uh, which I told him just to stop doing. He's too young. <laughs> well, he just he just brought in one of his wee speakers and starts playing. It. <laughs> I was like, what was he playing? Why do we? we do, I, I can't even remember. It was probably quite decent, but it was just <laughs> it was just the concept of the fact that he just come in and just like, with no regard to whether we wanted to listen to his music or not. Have you ever? Obviously, most players wear headphones, and I never. 
Motorhead phones are in and they'll, they'll get him ground. But I remember the coach Duncan Hodge sitting behind Hodge going to play a test match in New Zealand and I was sitting behind him in the bus and he had his headphones on but was singing along to whatever he was listening to. Is <laughs> <laughs> there anybody it, that it was that track? Boys on or nah. <laughs> I don't know what it was, but I just thought yeah, it's uh, quite interesting. Obviously no idea what's going on uh, there. Well, well, Cocker's is desperate for us to have no music in the change room. <laughs> he keeps he keeps dropping it in and like conversations like go go ahead. You don't like it when there's music in the changing rooms, you do. I'm like, yeah, no, nah, nah, we all we all really like it. It's like, oh, I, I just, I really, really would just prefer it if everybody had headphones. But all you boys seem to like it. I just want some somebody to come turn around and say they don't like it, so I can take it away. <laughs> just one. He just wants one person. But like, so we're like desperately saying, all the boys, like, if you get, even if you get pressured into it, you have to say that you like music in the changing rooms, otherwise it's gonna be silent. I had one in a plane reasonably recently so obviously after playing where uh, I thought I'd connected my Bluetooth headphones and I had them in my head and uh, I'm turning my music up and it, it wasn't working and eventually I get it loud enough I can hear it until the lady next to me <laughs> taps me in the leg and <laughs> says it's playing through your phone so I took my headphones <laughs> out full booner playing out for everybody listening. Well, thankfully what it was wasn't it? Little Mix or anything oh, like that I was going to say what was it? What was it? something was alright So Chris, this is it. the second time they've managed to unleash us by ourselves. We're on the road as well this weekend with Clyde Bank Studios. Thanks very much to uh, to Clyde for letting us in to use these studios. I don't think we've broken anything. Have you been pressing any buttons? I've got one button to press. It's start and stop on the, the record function here. Uh, I think we're all right. Yeah. I think so we've got by. Does that mean that you're the IT side of this podcast as well as the, uh, the rugby? No, just when you came in, they obviously <laughs> thought that guy's far more sensible. We'll, we'll, put, we'll, we'll put him in front of the laptop, and you, can, you can, you're sitting in the bucket in the corner. Well, all, all it remains for us to say is uh, is goodbye, and for you to press the button. Is that really us? Yes, let's go. Right, <laughs> thanks, folks. Uh, we'll. Oh, I don't know. Well, you press the wrong button, haven't no, you? No, no, it's fine. It's <laughs> Keep that in. It's in. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's not pressed, is it? <laughs> I hope it's not. Oh no. I don't, know if, it's still I don't know if we're starting again. Have we have recorded anything? Have you? <laughs> Why is it like honestly? <laughs> oh no, I press stop, I press the blue button. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening to this special episode. We'll be back soon here on the official Scottish Rugby Podcast. <laughs>